following the downing of that Su-24, Russia stepped up security over Syria, and Moscow has displayed some of its most advanced hardware it's brought in, too. One of them, let's take a closer look at ourselves, is the S-400 surface-to-air missile system. It can hit low-flying targets, which are harder to intercept, at a range of 400 kilometers, which means, basically, it covers most of Syria's airspace. That was deployed in Latakia at the end of November. The maximum target speed of that missile is 4.8 kilometers a second. Also, too, for the first time, journalists were allowed on the cruiser Moskva. The destroyer is providing support for the Mediterranean for the Russian Air Force in its bombing mission in Syria. Next, the Nazis Murad Gazdiev has more on all this modern hardware. Well, the Russian military promised us a surprise, and they certainly delivered. For the first time, journalists were allowed not only close, but allowed abroad the Russian Navy's guided missile cruiser uh, Moskva. Its uh, captain says its job is to provide air cover, air security for Russian uh, jets flying in Syria's skies and the Russian air base here in uh, Syria. And for that, it's got a vast array of weaponry, uh, short-range weapons, mid-range and long-range missiles, 64 uh, S-300 missiles. That warship, of course, isn't the only one here uh, in Syria. There are 11 other uh, Russian warships patrolling uh, the coast. But... Uh, Journalists were also allowed near another gem of uh, the Russian military, that is the S-400 anti-aircraft uh, system. Uh, it's uh, stationed at Khmeimi Air Base and envelops its range, uh, includes an area that includes most of uh, Syria as well as southern Turkey, large parts of it, uh, Jordan, uh, Israel. Uh, its security has, of course, been uh, beefed up in the aftermath of uh, Turkey shooting down a uh, Russian jet. But journalists were allowed to within a few meters uh, of the launches of components of that system, despite it being uh, top secret, uh, as Vladimir Putin said during his marathon question and answer uh, session. Uh, we can't forbid anyone from flying over Syria, but uh, fly only if you dare. Any force threatening Russian air groups fighting terrorism in Syria should be immediately destroyed. And that warning came from Vladimir Putin at the end of year meeting of the defense ministry. I order to act in the toughest way. All parties threatening the Russian forces and our infrastructure on the ground are to be destroyed immediately. Now let's talk to Artis Medina Kochnova, who's following the story for us. So, Medina, why was Putin talking about threats to Russian forces? Well, this particular statement was uh, made by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, uh, following uh, uh, the recent downing of a Russian warplane while it was conducting a combat mission in Syria by Turkish forces. Now, this particular incident happened just two weeks ago. But still, uh, this Friday, Vladimir Putin once again called for a broader cooperation with the U.S.-led coalition and in this international fight against the spread of ISIS in Syria. Now, speaking at the end of the year meeting at the Defense Ministry, Vladimir Putin said that uh, Russian, uh, Russian air military operation is aimed at uniting all forces that are currently involved in this fight, both the Syrian state army as well as the Western-backed opposition. The work of our military aircraft contributes to the alliance of the government forces and the Free Syrian Army. Right now, several of its divisions of more than 5,000 people, as well as the government troops, are advancing against terrorists in the provinces of Homs, Hama, Aleppo and Raqqa. We provide them and government troops with their support. We also support them with weapons and funding. Russian forces before mentioned that they were uh, using intel data that they received from the Free Syrian Army uh, in the Russian uh, in the current air military campaign led by Russia. Uh, now, what else was mentioned at this particular meeting was raised by uh, the country's defense minister, who said that uh, the uh, Islamic State's influence in Syria uh, keeps expanding. He also mentioned that ISIS at the moment controls about 70 percent of the Syrian territory. Uh, also mentioning that in Syria and Iraq, there are about 60,000 militants at the moment. And he said that this, of course, poses a threat that their actions might expand to other regions, including uh, the Central Asia as well as uh, the North Caucasus. The Russian Coast Guard in the Black Sea has signaled to a Turkish flagged vessel to change course after it had violated international law and hampered the movement of a drilling rig. 
The company that owned the platform reported the incident, saying that the Turkish vessel's captain didn't contact the Russian ship and didn't respond to calls. It's the second such incident in recent days. On Sunday, a Russian Navy ship fired warning shots at a Turkish boat in the Aegean to avert a possible collision. Let's get more on this now. We can speak to Sergei Trifskovich, who's foreign affairs editor of Chronicles magazine. Uh, Professor Trifskovich, many thanks for joining us. What's going on here? Two incidents in uh, close succession. Is it that we just weren't noticing these incidents like this before, or is there something more to this? I suspect there is something more to it. Actually, we didn't mention the incident when a Russian sailor with a, a rocket launcher on his shoulder allegedly threatened the city of Istanbul from the deck of his ship, which is, uh, uh, in my opinion, fitting in with the pattern of the Turks raising uh, the issue of uh, the Straits regime. Uh, the passage of warships through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles is governed by the 1936 Montreux con Convention, which was signed in Switzerland, and which gives special rights to the Black Sea littoral nations in uh, uh, the passage of warships. Uh, other countries are restricted to a three-week stay in the Black Sea. The same, of course, does not apply to Russian ships exiting from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. And in view of the overall deterioration of relations between Russia and Turkey following the ambush of the Suhoi 24 on November 24th, I think this is an overture to the Turkish intention to raise the issue of renegotiating the Montreux Convention uh, next year. It was signed in 1936 and it's and due for renewal every 20 years. So obviously, this would be a handy time for the Turks to start uh, raising tension and uh, to start claiming that uh, uh, the, not the number of incidents, for which, of course, they will blame the Russian side, indicates the need to impose some as yet unknown restrictions on the passage of Russian warships through the Straits. At least, uh, that seems to be the rationale behind it. Otherwise. Uh, it wouldn't make much sense because in the past such incidents had been relatively rare. Now, as, as I understand, this uh, this thoroughfare, this waterway, this is it's, it's it's very important for Russia in the sense of getting their ships through to the Mediterranean. As I also understand, under this um, legislation, that Ankara is supposed to allow Russian ships passage, but it's not impossible for them to stop it. How difficult would it be for Ankara to break that treaty using some, some technicalities in the legislation? It would be a major escalation of the dispute uh, between Russia and Turkey, which is increasingly acquiring the geopolitical overtones of a bygone era, because gaining access to the strait uh, and even control of the straits had been a major geopolitical objective of the Tsarist Russia, certainly between the reign of Catherine the Great in the late 18th century, when Russia obtained control over the northern uh, half of the Black Sea coast, and uh, the end of World War I, when uh, uh, the control of, of the Straits was also a British objective, the Gallipoli operation in 1915, which was supposed to open up direct access to uh, Odessa and the Crimean Peninsula. Had the British been successful in 1915 in obtaining control of the Straits, one might argue that uh, the outcome of the war for the Russians would have been different, that the revolution would have been averted. It's one of those great ifs in history. But I, do, I do apologise, Sergio. I'm afraid time has beaten us. I'm going to have to just interrupt you there. Many apologies. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on to speak to us. Okay. Though. We're just squeezing this breaking story in. Uh, Sergio Trifkovic there, our guest, Foreign Affairs Editor of Chronicles magazine, joining us from Montenegro. A team of experts have opened the flight recorder of a downed Russian Su-24 bomber in front of international experts and the media. The procedure took about an hour.
That Russian bomber was shot down by Turkish jets last month as Ankara claimed it violated its airspace. Moscow insists the aircraft never crossed into Turkish territory, though. It's hoped information in the Su-24's flight recorder will aid the investigation now. Artis Medina Koshnev has got the latest today. The black box was opened in front of journalists and that was even broadcast live by some of the channels. Now the authorities promise that the whole process will be carried out with maximum transparency for all sides involved and to ensure that uh, Russia's defense ministry as well as the aviation committee have invited experts from 14 different countries. However, only those from China and the UK agreed to participate. Now Russian officials said that they do have sufficient evidence that the Russian aircraft did not violate Turkish airspace and did not pose any threat to Turkey or its people. And they do hope that the data recorded on the uh, on the black box will help to confirm that. Now, it was also mentioned that pr Russia had previously uh, published a monitoring data of the flight, and nobody contests that, including uh, Turkey. Now, the flight record, as we've seen today, is intact. There was no work to performed on it before. Now, the media was told that uh, the decoding will be conducted over the weekend and the first results uh, will be published, are expected to be published, as early as on Monday. Since Tuesday, Russian jets have hit more than 200 Islamist targets in several Syrian provinces, including those of Aleppo and Raqqa. One of the largest strongholds destroyed was Islamic State's command post in Idlib. Russia has also granted Western media access to its key hub in the Takia. Anti correspondent Brad Gazdiev has the details. This is the third time foreign journalists have been allowed onto the Russian uh, airbase. But what marks this pool as special is that many of the channels here have been outright, well, hostile to Russia's operation in Syria. The Kremlin isn't even trying to hide the growing threat posed by Russia's intervention in Syria. Just after Russia launched its first airstrikes in Syria, and this, according to opposition activists, is the result. Yet, as big and bad as they've sometimes painted the Russians, they were still invited to see the base, and no one turned that offer down. Sky, CNN, CBS, this is their first opportunity to see Russian jets. They're taking full advantage of it, sometimes even getting in each other's way. They covered their ears, jumped, ducked, and filmed away. It's very uh, necessary to, to see it with your own eyes. Otherwise, you have no idea what's really um, going on here on the base and what's the idea of Russia um, with this operation. So it's very important to come here and not to read everything only in the internet or in the newspapers. So to have your own impression. And they filmed everything. At times, cameramen even jostled and jockeyed for that sweet camera spot. The face of Russia's presence in Syria, Major General Konoshenkov, proved especially popular. The press were eager to bend his ear for that one-on-one -on -one exclusive. From what we heard, coverage from the base was much more balanced. Gone was the microphone rattling bravado. And in its place, something that's been sorely missing in the media, a healthy dose of balance. Morad Gazdiev, RT, from Latakia, Syria.